Thank you all for joining us this evening. Today is September 2nd and you are joining the Dr. Cog board work session. I'm Ashley Stolzman, the vice chair, and I will be chairing this meeting this afternoon. Um, we are hosting this meeting electronically and it is being recorded because of COVID-19 and I'm going to call the meeting to order. We're going to take attendance this afternoon based on the attendee list and so folks can just double check next time we see meeting minutes to make sure their name showed up correctly. That takes us to the public comment portion of this meeting. I would request that there's no public comment on issues for which a prior public hearing has been held before the Board of Directors. We're going to unmute the lines at this time and ask any members of the public if they have any comments this afternoon. Melinda, if you want to let me, let me know when the lines are unmuted. Absolutely. Uh, they should be, everyone should have the ability to speak if need be at this point. All right, seeing no public comment, we will close the lines at this time. Okay, if you'll give me a moment to just mute everyone. Okay, we're ready for, to proceed. Thank you. So that takes us to our third item on our agenda, which is the summary of the July 1st, 2020 board work session. You'll find that in attachment A in your packet, and we'll just accept that summary this afternoon. If there are any questions or comments, you can go ahead and email them to myself, Melinda Stevens, or Doug Rex. That takes us to the fourth item on our agenda this afternoon, which is the update on the I-25 corridor planning and construction activities. It's attachment B in your packet this afternoon. Ron Papstorf, our Director on Transportation, Planning, and Operations, is going to introduce the item. Ron? Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, it's my pleasure to introduce Paul Josaitis, the Region 1 um, Regional Transportation Director for CDOT and his staff. Um, we felt that given the amount of work that has been going on and is scheduled to happen within the I-25 corridor through the Dr. Cog region, that it might be helpful for the board to understand sort of the full breadth and scope of all of that work. Um, so we asked um, CDOT and they graciously agreed to, to join us this afternoon to, to really take a more holistic view of the entire I-25 corridor. And you know, the board gets to see sort of individual projects, individual segments of I-25. And we really felt like it was important to sort of have the board have a good understanding of really the big, the big issues along the entire I-25 corridor. So you can see just the, the importance of that corridor and the importance of the work that's happening in that corridor. So CDOT's gonna walk through a presentation and talk about uh, major segments, kind of a background history of some of the major uh, work that's happened in the recent, recent past, uh, in different segments of I-25, um, current planning work or projects, and then upcoming upcoming work within the diff different segments of I-25. So with that introduction, happy to introduce Paul Josaitis, the Region 1 RTD for CDOT. Yeah, good evening, everybody. I'm really happy to be here tonight. Um, I'm going to be short here and just do some introductions, but I do want to say I'm glad we're talking about I-25 because it's uh, arguably the most important corridor in the state of Colorado, right next to I-70, of course. Um, so it's good to talk about it. Uh, when you think about traffic volumes on a roadway in Colorado, you can think about Central 25. We're at about 260,000 daily traffic on I-25 right now in Central Denver. And we're expecting that to hit north of 300,000 in the next 10 to 20 years. So it's good that we keep talking about uh, these kind of projects that we've been working on and then the future. And so with that, I just wanna introduce a few people on the call today who are gonna do some speaking. I'll actually start with Rebecca White, um, our director of the Division of Transportation Development. I'm sure most of you know her. Um, so she's on to help us answer questions and uh, listening in. Um, also, I want to acknowledge our planning team, Jordan Rudel and Veronica McCall, who are on the call. Uh, Carrie DiGiacomo, she's our South Program Engineer. Jay Hendrickson, who's our Central Program Engineer. Andy Stratton, who's our North Program Engineer. And Alazar Tesfaihi, who's our Traffic and Safety Program Engineer. Uh, so with that, I'm going to hand it over to Jessica Mickelbust. She's our uh, relatively new Deputy Director of Program Delivery, promoted from recently from being our environmental lead in Region 1. And I'm really happy to introduce her and to have her 
helping me out tonight and uh, she does a great job. So Jessica, take it away. Thanks, Paul. Can you just give me a head nod if you can hear me or say I'm Yes, audible? we got you, okay, Jessica. Thanks. Yes. <laughs> well, I just want to echo and Paul um, saying thank you to Dr. Cog for inviting us to come in front of you tonight. Um, we're excited to showcase all of the things that we have going along um, I-25 corridor. And, you know, really our presentation couldn't be more timely because just today CBS News um, announced that Denver ranked in the top 25 of the worst U.S. cities to drive in. So really a timely um, event that we're talking with you and really taking some time to focus on that important corridor. So our goal today with you is to just spend some time orienting you to all of the activities, past, present, and future that we have going along the corridor. So just a bit of background on some things that we have going on. Um, Region one, which stretches to just north of State Highway 7 down to the bottom of Douglas County, we have about 422 lane miles of through lanes on I-25. Um, so that's a lot of miles to manage. And as Paul mentioned, you know, the daily traffic volumes are, are really heavy and are just continuing to increase. So um, we currently have nine projects underway and we'll talk about some of those today with you. 24 projects have been completed along I-25 in the last five years. Uh, five projects have been accepted between just 2019 and 2020, 2020 totaling $168 million. Uh, in the last five years, we have completed construction totaling around $510 million. And as we went through our recent 2015 planning process, we've identified um, se severe needs along I-25 corridor um, that you know are greater than about a billion dollars in transportation funding. So just a little background there. And so as we put this together, we wanted to convey the depth and breadth of projects. And given that we probably all have a bit of Zoom zombie fatigue these days, we wanted to take a little bit of a different platform um, to showcase what's going on in the corridor. So what you've got on your screen now is a Google map. And we're gonna step through the layers um, one by one, but really felt like this was a good way to kind of showcase and give you a context for the location where some of these projects have occurred. Um, what we've noticed is that, you know, our larger projects like the Gap or some of the other ones get a lot of attention and we're very aware of those, but we also have a lot of other projects that are smaller in scope and scale that have really big impacts for safety and mobility through the I-25 corridor in Denver. So we wanna talk through those today as well. So we are, you know, it's kind of like trying out a new recipe for company and you haven't baked it before. Um, that's this map. We haven't used this platform before. We're really hopeful it conveys information seamlessly for you today as we walk through the presentation. And we would love to hear feedback if you found it to be a useful way to follow along. Um, so with that, I'm going to turn it over um, and I'll just, give you a, a quick note. We are going to start um, with our traffic folks and then we'll walk through the corridor from the north and then the central and then the south. Um, so with that, I'm going to turn it over to Alizar Tesfe, who is our traffic and safety engineer, and he's going to be highlighting some of our traffic projects. Um, Alizar, I hope you're here. I don't um, know if you are, but you, you're welcome to go start. Okay, I will start with the I-25 southbound bottleneck project from I-76 uh, to I-70. So CDOT Region 1 traffic has been able to implement several bottleneck mitigation projects over the years. Our target is to implement at least two projects a year. So these projects are prioritized based on cost and high uh, low cost, high benefit, with more expensive mitigation strategies ranked lower due to lack of anticipated funding or resources. So usually after implementation, we also go back and evaluate if the strategy implemented is actually working or not. So this section of I-25 within the project area contains several closely spaced interchanges like US-36, I-76 on ramps to southbound, so due to the high volume traffic joining southbound traffic, so these interchanges are I mean, related to the merge, diverge, and weave movements. So this freeway segment experiences a huge amount of uh, recurring congestion. So this project mainly consists of striping changes, 
with minimal amount of shoulder widening between 58th Avenue off ramp and on ramp interchanges to add auxiliary lanes between I-76 and I-70. And also we'll be adding a ramp metering on 58th Avenue on ramps to southbound I-25. So the project cost for this is $1.5 million. So our next traffic project is enhanced wrong way signing and marking. So this is a safety project to prevent and mitigate wrong way driving on a limited access facility of ramps within region one. So this is a region wide implementation effort which is divided in different phases. So I-25 is in phase two, which this project is currently under at. And the limit of the project is from State Highway 7 to Plum Creek. So this will include 66 ramps. So the cost of the I-25 portion of it is $2 million. So the next one is the wrong way detection system on I-25 at the 70th Avenue. I know I have a project here if Veronica can add it. So this is a pilot project for the implementation of the phase three, phase three one way detection, which will include uh, technology. So we piloted this location because this location is a pit complex interchange. Depending on time of day, this ramp is both on ramp and off ramp on a reversible lane of the express lane. So there have been incidents when vehicle traveling southbound down this ramp when the lane is going northbound. So even during our testing period, our results have shown more than six incidents have been prevented since the system was installed. So it alerts people and they know that they're driving the wrong way and they turn around and go in the right direction. So the cost of the pilot project is about $13,000, but the phase three uh, project is currently under design and different location within the region. So our next project is I-25 RAM metering installation. So this project is in Douglas County on I-25 from Lincoln Avenue to Plum Creek Parkway and it consists of like 16 on ramps. So this ramp metering project improves traffic flow, reducing traffic turbulence at a merge location by allowing vehicles to enter one at a time instead of a large group. So it also holds influx of traffic to the freeway segments that are already congested at the capacity or near capacity. So the total project of this project is about $4 million. So another project we have is a region one, six inch lane line marking. So this is, CDOT has gone to six inch uh, lane line marking on our high speed to improve visibility and safety. So this is also a region wide project, but I-25, is also included from Plum Creek to State Highway 7 in the region. So currently we have completed to Plum Creek and Bellevue and hopefully we will complete the rest of the I-25 by uh, November. So I have, I have included, we have a picture so uh, just to show you, this is a before at Happy Canyon And this is our new six inch marking. This is, and we also piloting a shadow striping, which you see right now. It's a 10 foot uh, wide six inch and the shadow black, which we usually install it in a concrete section for a higher contrast and visibility on the concrete section of our freeway. I think I'm done with my traffic projects. Any questions? If you have. Thank you. So if any directors have any questions at this time, and for if folks who are speaking could please mute, that would help that. Um, go ahead and raise your hand if you have any questions at this time. All 
All right, well, I don't see any. Mm -hmm. Director Papstorf, is there anything else in this presentation? Yep, I thought Jay Hendrickson, our central program engineer, will be presenting now. Jay, are you on the line? Or I'm sorry, Andy, Andy Stratton, our North program engineer. Yeah, that's what I thought. I'm on the line, but I thought Andy was going to go first. Yep, Andy's first. Thanks. All right. Do you guys hear me? I think I got unmuted. Yes. Okay, great. Um, yeah, thanks. I'm Andy Stratton. I'm the North program engineer for Region 1 and cover the uh, I-25 corridor um, in Adams and Broomfield counties, uh, basically from 51st um, up to uh, State Highway 7. So I'm going to talk through um, the past, present, and future projects along uh, I-25. Um, and we'll start with the uh, Told Express lanes. A lot of the, the projects in this corridor through this stretch have been the Told Express lanes over the last couple of years. Um, and, and the first one that we completed was the segment two express lanes, which went from US 36 up to 120th. And, and the idea behind implementing the told express lanes um, in each direction along the corridor was to, you know, increase our roadway capacity, help uh, reduce delays, manage congestion, um, and provide a choice uh, for travel time reliability along the corridor. And so, um, Segment two got completed in 2016 and has been operational the last couple of years, and, and the cost was about $70 million to implement that stretch. Um, on the heels of that, we were able to extend the express lanes um, for through the I-25 segment three stretch, um, which is I-25 from 120th up to uh, State Highway 7. Um, we were the recent construction project that just got completed earlier this year. Um, extended the express lanes up to E470 only um, at a cost of $100 million. And then we are looking at the remaining segment then from E470 up to State Highway 7, including the State Highway 7 um, DDI interchange and mobility hub is the next project that we have about 50% design on. Um, and the cost of that is around $200 million for that entire package. Um, then continuing up the corridor, um, and, and that's slated as a future project. Um, and then continuing up the corridor, we move into region four of CDOT and they have um, express, future express lanes in I-25 segment four, which would go from State Highway 7 to State Highway 66, um, which I believe they have some preliminary design on. And then segment five, um, which is State Highway 66 to Weld County Road 38, which is the boundary of the Dr. Cog area. Um, so, so those are all future projects as we continue to build out the um, I-25 express lanes um, from Denver up through Fort Collins that was identified in the I-25 um, EIS um, that was undertaken um, and completed in 2012 or 2011. Um, in addition to the express lanes, I'll jump down to the southern end of the corridor. Um, right now, we're working on the I-270 um, corridor, and I know that's not um, on I-25 per se, but as we get going on the EA for I-270, it has a direct impact on um, improvements on I-25, especially around the 270 US 36 I-25 interchange. And so, the EA right now, um, we just kicked it off a couple months ago and we expect to wrap it up um, at, uh, towards the end of next year, but it's to evaluate new capacity, infrastructure improvements to improve safety, travel time reliability, and reduce delays um, and improve efficiency of truck freight movement on the 270 corridor. Um, and some of the um, preliminary results that we're starting to see on 270 um, as we alleviate some of the congestion in this area, um, it has a direct impact on the performance of I-25, especially to the north of 270 through that segment. And I know we have an EA on I-25, you know, from 84th to 104th um, that we were getting ready to complete. But as we started 270, we decided to put that EA on hold right now to kind of understand all the impacts that some of the 270 improvements um, might have on this area. Um, so, so we're gonna try and understand it a little better from 270 point of view um, to make sure we're, we're creating the right type of improvements there to the north. Um, 
the the other project that's in conjunction with 270 is is the Direct Connects um, study that we're starting to look at. Um, that's right at the interchange of 270 I-25 and US 36, and that's looking at how we effectively um, connect express lane connections um, through there um, because a lot of turbulence at the end of our projects are when the express lanes are merging back into general purpose and we lose some of our efficiency uh, and reliability of our general purpose lanes as well when we end these express lanes. So we're taking a look at how to effectively um, and what the impacts are, how to effectively connect some of our express lane systems that we have um, at the nexus of this interchange. Um, and then the other uh, important things that we're working on or taking a look at on the I-25 corridor is the uh, transit stops and the mobility hubs um, along the corridor. And right now, you know, we have the, the Thornton Park and Ride at 88th um, that we're looking at how to, how to keep that functional. Um, Wagon Road at 120th is a big transit component. Um, and then a, a mobility hub up at State Highway 7 is kind of the future of, of this corridor that we have outlined. That's what we have going on in the in the north area of I-25. Thank you. We'll pause there for questions from directors. Go ahead and raise your hand if you have comments or questions. And our first question or comment is from Director Atchison. Let me now. We can hear you. Okay, thanks. I couldn't get it unmuted. Uh, Andy, this is Herb Atchison. On the I-25 corridor, we're still getting reports of large slowdowns, not so much right now with COVID, but just before COVID hit. On the southbound 25 between 84th and 120th. Now that uh, COVID has started to let people go back to work, what kind of a volume are you seeing in there? Um, I don't know if I have the latest numbers, but yeah, like as we expected, we were, we were seeing um, quite a reduction you know during the march april may time frame but um as we see traffic start picking up uh, through the summer and, and people start getting back to work um our traffic volumes are starting to um you know approach pre-covid numbers pretty quickly especially on this i-25 southbound corridor like you mentioned and uh, yep. mayor atchison uh this is paul um hi. i i don't know hi um i don't know about um i-25 north here but um i have mentioned that the eisenhower tunnel we've actually exceeded some peaks from last year and i just had a call on the i-25 south quarter and we're seeing almost identical numbers to the previous year so i would anticipate very similar in this quarter as well well i know our objective was to try to get that traffic impacts down with the expansions that we're making but i think and andy's point is very valid is trying to make those transitions from typical traffic about down into the areas basically south of 36 around 58 and stuff that still seems to be very big bottlenecks that we continue to deal with even with the COVID numbers starting back up uh, as you indicated paul those bottlenecks are still there and I don't know how we're going to resolve it other than get people out of their cars. But Andy, the other one I was interested in, that next segment on northbound 25, Highway 7 up, or I'm sorry, C470 to Highway 7 with the managed lanes. You said that was still in the design phase. Do you have an, any kind of a target for when that would go to bid and when you are anticipating construction complete of that segment? Uh, no, we don't have any of our uh, money programmed for that segment right now. Um, Thank you. Yeah. Director, did you have a question? Director Ashton, did you have any other questions? Yeah, just the other one is going to the 271. Paul, I think I got the invite for that one. That starts in what, two weeks? I think Jessica would have the exact date. Um, sounds about about that time frame, though. I know I was invited too. I just have too many meetings to go to. Jessica, yeah. do you have the date? Yeah, hi, Mayor. I believe it was scheduled for the end of September. I want to say September 30th for the advisory team. Yeah. Yep. Yeah, that's correct. Okay. Thank you, guys. All right, thank you, and, Director 
Atchison. So folks, if, if you could please raise your hands, and I know we've made a number of CDOT um, staff panelists, but if you could please make sure you state your name and who you are since we're not seeing video and folks will be listening to this mainly. So we, we need to just maintain order so folks know who's talking. So the next person with questions or comments is Jessica Sandgren. Director Sandgren. Thank you, it's Jessica Sandgren, City of Thornton. Can you hear me okay? Yes, we can. Yes. Okay, thank you. And I'm sorry because um, part of Andy's presentation, um, I couldn't hear half of it. I had bad connection at the moment, so maybe he mentioned it. I'm just curious about, um, I know we've had this conversation many times about the area between 84th up to Highway 7, but um, just the unfinished I-25 section in Thornton. I know we've studied um, the crash re uh, safety items and um, we know this is an ongoing problem, but I. I didn't see any. Um, I didn't see anything on here about that, so I was just wondering where we were, and maybe I missed it when I couldn't hear you. Andy. Uh, yeah, I'll I'll just go over that um, real quick again. Yeah, I was mentioning, you know, we have we have the EA um, that we are nearing completion on the improvements between 84th and 104th that we were hoping to, you know, try and address some of the uh, high accident rates that we're seeing in the corridor, um, and. You know, as we were finishing up that EA, we started the 270 corridor project and we saw a lot of interaction with some of the preliminary results that we saw on 270 um, and the whole interchange area at 270, 36 and I-25. And so we're going to try and understand those effects on that I-25 corridor a little more here over the next couple months uh, to ensure that what we have come up with the EA um, kind of handles a lot of those improvements. Um, and, and a lot of that traffic volume as it gets released up up into North uh, Thornton there. Um, so so right now it's just kind of on hold pending some some more investigation on the 270 corridor and that interaction there. Director Sanchez, did that answer your question? Yeah, I do actually have one more to follow up with that. Um, and so I want to make sure that we still have, I think there's some fear growing in the area um, up north here along the corridor that we will be left um, behind again, just looking at some of the project suggestions. You know, that Tiffia area was supposed to be meant for that particular section. Um, we've been promised that funding. And so we wanna make sure that even though there will be some new studies that that money is still going to stay in that section as it has been promised. So I, I think there's some growing fear that that isn't going to happen. And so um, you'll probably start hearing from us a little more on that. I would imagine. Andy, did you have any follow-up on that? No, uh, duly noted. I mean, H HPTE is trying to look at effective ways, you know, to to utilize that, that toll revenue and get improvements on on the corridor uh, done. And th they would they would be able to speak more um, to where specifically they are on some of those endeavors. Um, Thank you. At, at another time. Thank you. Yeah. Director Sangren, any other follow-up questions? No, that's it for now. Thank you. Thank you very much. So that is all of the hands we have for this portion. And so that takes us to the next presenter. Did you want to cue this up, Jessica, or just dive in? Go ahead, Jay. OK. All right, uh, thank you all very much. Uh, my name is Jay Hendrickson. I am the uh, Region 1 Central uh, Program Engineer uh, overseeing um, state highway facilities in the city and county of Denver. And I'm going to walk you through, um, you know, the, uh, the various projects, past, present, and future that we've got going on on the uh, very congested and very busy I-25 corridor in, the, in basically the Denver metro area. Um, I'm going to start off uh, with uh, the I-25 uh, Central PEL study, um, and this was uh, basically uh, an effort that recognized uh, about four or five years ago. Um, you know, one of the highest volume corridors in in the uh, in the state really had really no no future plans and, and no. Uh, uh, no plans for any anything programmed or or um, so uh, I, I felt it was you know incumbent upon me as a new central program engineer to 
kind of start taking a look at this. And, you know, I recognize that, you know, basically the Capitol, uh, city and county building, Bronco Stadium, the Pepsi Center, uh, you know, uh, you know, just all this stuff was right in the middle of there. Um, and, and this uh, facility was just, you know, incredibly congested. So we uh, put together a, uh, a, a study, a PEL uh, planning and environmental linkage study, if anyone is unfamiliar with the PEL acronym, to look into uh, potential uh, improvements to the I-25 corridor between uh, Santa Fe on the south end and 20th Street up on the north end. And um, we basically, um, uh, so the, you know, we, we, we can, um, we put together a purpose and need for the study and the purpose uh, was to recommend transportation improvements uh, in the San, uh, I-25 Central Corridor between Santa Fe and 20th to reduce congestion, improve safety and travel time reliability for the movement of people and goods. Uh, and the improvements also consider access to and from I-25 as well as connectivity across I-25 for, for pedestrians, bicycles, transit and local traffic. And, you know, in, in addition to that, we coordinated very closely with uh, City and County of Denver and with the numerous stakeholders on the project. The, the outcomes and recommendations of the study were basically three families um, of, of uh, recommendations uh, based on, on the impacts and the, and the scope and the funding uh, uh, available. Uh, the first family would be what we call bring the corridor to standard. Um, uh, basically bring uh, the design uh, uh, and the, and the, um, uh, the geometry into compliance with uh, current uh, design standards uh, and, uh, and safety standards for uh, an interstate corridor of this, this uh, volume and speed. Uh, and that was basically, well, well you know, the, the, the baseline was the, the no action, uh, obviously, which, which all NEPA activities, you know, uh, consider. Uh, so this would, this would be the, the lowest level uh, improvements. And then um, what we moved on to from that recommendation would be consideration of collector distributor roads and braided ramps strategically implemented uh, at locations, you know, uh, throughout the corridor uh to um you know uh, effectively um you know reduce access um re uh, improve uh congestion um and, and improve uh safety by the implementation of uh, or by you know by, by diverting some of the traffic off of the uh the mainline corridor uh onto onto other facilities and by braiding some of the um the accesses uh in order to uh, eliminate a lot of the weaves and sideswipe crashes that we see on the corridor, and that that was sort of the middle of the road recommendation. And then the and then the highest level was basically a uh, recommendation for managed lanes, added capacity uh, on the corridor uh, uh, to you know to provide choice uh, and and um, uh, and to provide uh, travel time reliability uh, for the traveling public. Uh, obviously, a you know, much more costly and more impactful um, uh, recommendation. Um, but what this does basically is paves the way for subsequent uh, analysis and environmental clearance to, um, you know, to, to look into application of, of some of these recommendations. So that's a high level overview of the I-25 PEL study. And then as a kind of like a, a offshoot or, or a peel off of that, we, um, you know, we recognize that the, the Spear Boulevard and the 23rd Avenue uh, bridge crossings uh, right in the heart of downtown, and you can see on the map there, the red, um, you know, are some of the, some of the highest volume, most congested, congested, and also some of the lowest clearance structures along the entire stretch of I-25 from the southern terminus to the northern terminus, uh, I don't know if it's uh, Texas to Wyoming or something like that, um, which you know has significant in impacts on safety and on congestion and also on freight um, and and uh, economic uh, activity, uh, as you can imagine. Um, we uh, you know so as a as as a spinoff from the e the PEL study, um, the 
the PEL study recommended um, improvements to the interchanges. And we view the sphere and the 23rd uh, interchanges as, as a complex. Um, right now, there's, I believe, as many as six or eight accesses. Um, and you know, one of the one of the objectives is to try to reduce those those uh, access points to to reduce the side friction on the corridor. But that's all to be determined. We are in the process right now of uh, uh, selecting a consultant uh, to conduct the environmental assessment for the Spear and 23rd uh, Avenue bridge replacements, which uh, are um, bridge enterprise funding eligible and. Um, you know, so so we have we have some funding for the bridge replacements, and then depending on the alternatives that are developed, uh, you know, we're going to be looking to implement um, uh, improvements that will, uh, if not include, will not preclude um, future improvements such as managed lanes and potential direct connections, um, possibly at Spear or or uh, other um, possible connections. Um, and then so that's that's kind of what we call sort of the north third and and the limits of that ea are basically 20th down uh well they're they're yet to be determined exactly but you know somewhere north of colfax up to 20th uh to account for the the narrowing at the 15th uh and uh, the, the section between 15th and 20th up there which is obviously going to be a, a challenge um moving on from there um uh, many of you are probably familiar uh, uh over the last 10 probably maybe 15 years uh we have been working on uh developing and studying and implementing what we call the valley highway eis uh projects and uh just a ver very quick high level overview of that the valley highway eis was i believe conducted between 2006 and 2010 or paul maybe you can correct me on those dates but it's quite a while ago and we've gotten uh, decision documents for phase one and phase two, and there and phase uh, five and six. There were there were six phases total, um, and so phase one basically included uh, the Alameda uh, bridge over I-25, the uh, northbound uh, ramp access from Santa Fe to I-25, and the Santa Fe spooey interchange underneath I-25. Um, and those were have all been completed over the last 10 or so years. Uh, most recently, the Spooey interchange uh, just like a, within the last two years, I believe. Um, and uh, those were probably about 60 to 90 million dollars total of project delivery uh, for those projects. Um, phase two is basically uh, I-25 uh, and Alameda interchange, and um, we are reevaluating the northbound access. And so uh, under an agreement with Denver uh, to, uh, as Dr. Cog is, is probably aware, we, we reached an agreement to um, fund through Dr. Cog the uh, phase two, the, the, uh, the, basically the bridge over the Platte River and the associated improvements at La Pan and Alameda. And we're looking to incorporate some uh, multimodal bike and ped improvements on the on the river, uh, the path below and across um, uh, across Alameda uh, above. And then, you know, we'll be evaluating the northbound access subsequently. Phases three and four uh, basically um, provide for uh, geometric and, and operational improvements to I-25 essentially between uh, Alameda and US-6, and then also uh, provide for uh, grade separations between the, uh, the consolidated main line and Calamath and Santa Fe, uh, those at grade in, uh, uh, crossings. And then, um, and then phases five and six were effectively the US-6 design build project that was delivered, completed probably about three, four years ago, maybe four or five years ago. Um, I think it was about $105 million, and it included, uh, you know, mostly uh, along US-6 there, but uh, also bridges over I-25, accesses at I-25, and then we also added on a about a $3.5 million change order uh, to uh, extend basically the merge lane from the northbound Santa Fe on-ramp 
uh, which was causing quite a bit of congestion on that ramp. Uh, and it still is yet to be completely resolved, but um, it was just a, a, you know, a, a, I guess a stopgap measure to try to improve that. Um, so that that is basically covers the the Valley Highway EIS project, and then um, I'm just gonna there there are a number of other smaller projects, the interim project, the Bronco Arch bridge replacement. I'm not gonna go into those, but just know that those are out there. But the last thing I want to touch on is um, what we call Smart 25, and that is a a, a basically a high tech. Hold on, I'm logging into my other computer. Uh, Sorry, um, uh, it's a high tech uh, ramp metering algorithm uh, that in conjunction with uh, uh, the Australian Victorian, uh, Victoria Roads um, uh, to implement basically traffic metering, uh, traffic monitoring devices and ramp metering devices. And the, the monitoring devices are, are what we affectionately call turtles. Uh, and TIRTL, uh, T-I-R-T-L, stands for the Infrared Traffic Logger. And basically, if you look, you can see some pictures where they're installed in the median uh, there. Um, and I don't know if we got a chance to show the, the detailed pictures, but um, at any rate, there, yeah, there we go. Uh, it's, it's about a, you know, uh, you know, a little bit bigger than a bread box. Um, and they paint it green. And what this does is it, it detects traffic and most importantly detects gaps in traffic. And then it zaps that information down to Australia, down under. And then the Vic Roads uh, algorithm uh, conducts analysis based on the data coming in on the gaps and the, and the, and the non-gaps. And then based on the, uh, the anticipated upcoming gaps, uh, it, it uh, fires the ramp meter uh, it, it, so that the merging traffic has the gaps in traffic uh, to merge into. Um, I'm not a I'm not a traffic wizard, and that's that's my my understanding of it. Um, but uh, it, it's that's been implemented uh, in Australia very successful, and other other markets uh, around the world. Um, the 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 limits of that project are from Ridgegate up to University in the northbound direction only. Um, that project is approximately uh, well. It was an interesting uh, um, uh, advertising and contracting process that we went through. It was initially 7.6 million, but then we added in the turtle uh, installation and, and um, uh, um, material. Uh, so it's about approximately 10 million dollar project uh, to implement uh, this this. Uh, um, Smart 25 um, pilot project, and 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 that's very much what it is. We're once we have it installed, we're going to go through a testing period, and then we're going to have a demonstration period, and then an evaluation to assess whether we're going to continue with this or you know and not you know and uh, you know short of it just completely failing, which no one no one is uh, thinking this will happen. Uh, I, I'm very uh, hopeful and optimistic that we're going to see this implemented more, you know, because in the 21st century, we obviously we need to leverage our technology to the best that we can. So um, that is basically uh, the the central segment of I-25 in the Denver metro area. And with that, I will uh, open it up for any questions or comments that anybody might have. Thank you. Thank you. If any directors have questions or comments, go ahead and raise your hand at this time. All right, seeing none, that cues up the next presentation. Director Papstorf, do you know who's going next? Yes, Madam Chair, I believe it's Carrie DiGiacomo. Um, Melinda, if you could unmute uh, Carrie, please. Absolutely. There we go. Thank you. Um, hi, I'm Carrie DiGiacomo. I am the South Program Engineer with Region 1, and I oversee the areas in Arapahoe and Douglas counties. We do the planning, design, and construction of the highways in those locations. Um, the first project I wanted to bring up is the I-25 and Bellevue interchange. That is on our 10-year list. It is considered a priority for us as we had um, made some improvements, interim improvements on I-225. We closed the DTC access 
for southbound I-25, and it has pushed some traffic onto Bellevue, which our local agencies are currently studying right now. Um, there are two alternatives that are being considered. One is a single point urban interchange at Bellevue, and the other alternative is a split diamond with Union, where you would have the southbound off-ramp exiting at Union and the northbound on-ramp going on at that location. And then um, Bellevue would still have the northern ramps. <clears throat> so right now there isn't a consensus on the alternatives that are moving forward, but we are going out to the public here in about October, the local agency is, um, showing some pedestrian and bicycle improvements tied with those various alternatives to get public input. Both alternatives are looking to cost about $100 million. And so our 10-year plan is looking at trying to get some improvements there at the Bellevue Interchange. Um, right now, I, the Union um, Split Diamond seems to have you know, the stronger support, but there are some differences in that um, in which alternative is the best right now. So if we do go with, forward with the split diamond, um, we are looking at being able to phase some of those improvements. And so that's what we were focusing on in our 10-year plan, but we'll be showing the full $100 million improvement for that interchange. Moving on to the next project was a completed project at Arapahoe Interchange. We did complete that in 2018. And it really improved the operations of that interchange at I-25. Um, notably on I-25 was more the backup southbound exiting at that interchange. We would have backups um, extending back into the through lanes, which were causing a lot of safety concerns at that interchange. So that did um, finish the completion of that one in 2018 at $66 million. We also completed a project down south that was the Lincoln to County Line Lane Balance Project. And that project was actually back in our 2002 EIS. We just had not had the funds to make those improvements. That is completed now. Um, we only have a couple interchanges that are still identified on that 2002 EIS that we have not funded quite yet. Um, so it did really look at adding that additional lane and restriping efforts and stuff to um, improve the through movements there and the connection with C-470. In that same area, there is, um, we are looking at improvements at the Ridgegate Transit Station that's there, um, potentially putting some slip ramps there off of the interstate with bus staying um, to improve mobility on the regional operations through the area. We have completed a study in 2019. It was the PEL from C-470 to Monument. Um, that study, we did kind of pause it. We had kicked it off back in 2016. We paused it to deliver the gap to construction, and then we, which I will talk about here shortly, but and then we came back and finished the PEL in 2019. The recommendations that came out of that PEL is to extend the express lane that we're building currently in the gap, extend it all the way north to C470 so that we would connect another express lane corridor to the C470 express lanes that just opened up. And then also to add an additional lane throughout the entire corridor in the future, and that lane is yet to be determined what operational aspects that lane would have. So that was the recommendations that came out of our PEL, which helps us in planning um, in any development that's coming forward to look at what that future vision is for the interstate. One aspect that did come out of that PEL was really a mobility hub in Castle Rock. It is kind of a missing link on getting people north into Denver. There's quite a bit of demand and need down in the Castle Rock area. So we have been talking to a developer um, that we are looking at where the mobility hub seems to make the most sense. We did look at a few different locations. The one that's moving forward is south of Black Feather, and it would serve kind of a heart of the area of people coming out of Castle Rock headed north. The mobility hub would be there to serve their needs. Um, so that is moving forward right now. We are looking at implementing that in phases. Right now, it's got about $6 million where we will do the slip ramps on the outside, 
but that is going to be a center loading station going forward um, as we get the additional funds to move that mobility hub um, and build it out entirely. Then down south, we are under construction in the gap. Um, it has been going on since 2018, so we're coming up on two years of construction. We will finish in 2022, uh, for the most part be done in 2021, but there will be um, still lingering work to be done in 2022. We have broken it out into different packages and the Northern package about six miles will be complete in November of this year. And then we have the Southern two packages that will take into the 2022. The middle piece has a lot of bridges. We've got overall in the corridor, we've got about 10 bridges. So we have five wildlife crossings and then we're replacing some of the other bridges on the corridor to accommodate. Um, this is an express lane, it has a buffer. We're building shoulders, which are desperately needed down in that area. And I'm trying to think if there's anything else on um, the gap. So we are looking at the gap environmental assessment also identified a wildlife overpass which is kind of in the area that's zoomed in there. It was a grant application um, submittal by Douglas County to do an overpass. So all of our other wildlife oh, um, crossings on the gap are all underneath the roadway. This one that Douglas County is trying to move forward is looking at one that would go over the interstate. So that's going to run about 15 to 17 million dollars. Um, they have worked with open space on both sides to try to really move this forward and get the right of way donated and it will serve the elk population. There is a very strong elk population down in this area to help them cross the interstate. So that is something that may be coming up and is something that is um, a focus that's coming out of the um, environmental assessment that we may be moving forward. I think with that, those were the projects on the south end, if there's any questions. Thank you so much. Are there any questions from directors at this time? Go ahead and raise your hand. The first question is from Director Nicholas Williams. Anyway. Nicholas, go Yep, yep, got it. Thank you. Sorry. Uh, Nicholas Williams, City and County of Denver. Hey, Rebecca, could you talk a little bit more detail about what the kind of components or elements of the mobility hub are planned to be? Which mobility hub? Uh, Castle Rock. Castle Rock? Yeah. Um, right now, right now it's an undeveloped area. And so they, there will be an underpass underneath the interstate where when it's built out, it will have the central loading station. Right now it is um, planned that it will just be the slip ramps on the outside. And I guess looking at this picture, it kind of, I was trying to get a good context and let you know where it's sitting. It's above, yeah, it's kind of right in, it's kind of hard to tell here. So it's kind of where it says the Metzler Ranch Community Park. It's more in line. Well, actually a little north of there. Yeah. Um, so it, it sits right south of the Meadows Founders Interchange and it's north of um, where Santa, well, it's actually just south of where Santa Fe's crossing over. Sorry, now I'm getting my context of what you're seeing on the screen. So it is south of where Santa Fe crosses over and it's sitting about right where the cursor is right now. Um, in that area, it would, the develop, there's a huge development being planned there. It allows the railroads to connect. It allows busting um, services to come through there. So is, as railroad may end up being passenger rail at some point in time, it does allow that all to tie together and serve the area. So it is going to be a center loading station eventually, but right now it will be a slip ramp. Does that answer the questions or I'm not sure? It does. Williams. Thank you. Yep, that's right. exciting. Thank you. Director Williams, do you have any other questions? No further questions. Great. Any other directors have questions at this time? All right. Thank you very much. Director Papstorf, I'll turn it back over to you. Thank you, um, Madam Chair. I think um, if 
Paul or Jessica have any wrap up comments for CDOT? Yeah, this is Paul. Um, you know, um, I just like to thank you all for listening in tonight. Um, obviously, we are doing a lot of work on Interstate 25 and um, anything from bottleneck reduction projects that we're really excited about because for a low amount of money, we solve those bottleneck problems that everybody encounters as they drive to work every day. Uh, so, and as Alazar said, we do a couple of those every single year, and we actually have a strategic plan of bottleneck reduction projects. And when we go back in there on those projects um, a year later, and we take a look at how they are doing operationally, we've just been seeing some really good results from these low cost, high impact kind of projects. So uh, love those, and we have uh, things like uh, transit-oriented uh, mobility hubs, which are, you know, uh, another necessary thing to solve the traffic problems in the metro area. And then, of course, managed lanes. So um, just the, the whole gamut from small projects to big projects, and we're excited that we had a chance to bring those to you tonight. So thanks very much. Thank you very much for the presentation on all those exciting projects this evening, and we look forward to seeing them all come to completion hopefully on time and under budget that'll be great so that takes us to our next topic this evening which is an update on the front range passenger rail planning process we're going to have a, a introduction from jacob rieger our manager um, of long-range transportation planning and actually a director on the commission jacob okay can can everyone hear me now Yes, we can. Okay, thank you, Madam Chair. And um, it's almost five, so I'll just say good evening, everyone. Um, again, Jacob Rieger, uh, Long Range Transportation Planning Manager, Dr. Cog, uh, Vice Chair of the Southwest Chief and Front Range Rail Commission. Um, so the commission's been doing a lot of work um, in a blended team format with CDOT um, and a consulting team to do a lot of uh, planning, a lot of technical work. Um, and a lot of stakeholder and public engagement on front range passenger rail. Hopefully most of you have seen, you know, one or more of the kind of recent activities that have been occurring that we're going to cover tonight. Uh, but we have been doing corridor segment, um, segment stakeholder coalition meetings. Uh, we had a month long virtual online public meeting. Uh, we've done some survey and other work um, along with all the kind of technical work. Uh, that we've been doing as well. We've also had some meetings with um, certain jurisdictions working our way up and down the corridor, uh, talking about more some sort of technical issues at the local level. So hopefully you all have seen sort of pieces of that, but just like the last presentation, we wanted to give you kind of a more holistic look on what we've been doing on Front Range Passenger Rail and what's coming up um, in the months ahead. So with that, it's my pleasure to introduce um, our Rail Commission's Project Director, Staff Person, Randy Grauberger, um, and his staff person, Spencer Dodge, uh, to walk you through the presentation. Thank you. All right, thank you everybody and, and good evening. Um, this is a real opportunity to uh, come back and, and update you folks. I know we were at one of your board work sessions uh, at a conference room downtown about a year ago, I think. Uh, at that time, I remember handing out some of our MetroQuest survey cards uh, that was that survey took place July through September, so it was probably pretty close to a year ago now when when we were down uh, providing you with a presentation about Front Range Passenger Rail, and today we're anxious to uh, give you a little bit of an update, and I'll go through this pretty quickly and allow you to have some time for uh, questions and be glad to answer those. So, uh, next slide, Spencer, please. Uh, this is the same commission that uh, we talked to you about a year ago. Uh, there is really only one change to the commission. Uh, the BNSF representative is now DJ Mitchell. Uh, Pete Rickershauser did a wonderful job for the original Southwest Chief Commission and, and the Southwest Chief and Front Range Passenger Rail Commission for uh, two or three years, but Pete has retired and uh, the BNSF has replaced him with DJ Mitchell. DJ brings a lot of uh, credentials to this commission. DJ happens to be the vice president of passenger rail operations for the entire BNSF network. So uh, having DJ on board is, is a real pleasure. Uh, I've actually got a, a call with him tomorrow and I'll be on the phone with DJ for probably about an hour and, and picking his brain and, 
and DJ and, and the Union Pacific representative, Nathan Anderson, are both extremely engaged in this project. Other than that, the, the, uh, my bosses, my 11 bosses, the voting members of the commission uh, remain the same. Uh, and Jacob, I'll let you know, Jacob won uh, a reappointment to vice chair of the commission by unanimous consent. So good job, Jacob. Keep doing a great job for us. Next slide. Again, this is just real quickly, the commission's purposes. Uh, the commission does have two primary focuses. Its original purpose was uh, focused on the Southwest Chief, maintaining that Amtrak service across Southeastern Colorado. That remains a uh, certainly a focus. We continue to work with Amtrak, BNSF, and in our neighboring states to uh, complete and, and uh, some of the federal grants that we have received over the past several years. Uh, we're upgrading the, the track condition, we're upgrading the signal systems with positive train control, and that, that route continues to uh, be really one of the best long distance trains in the country. Of course, you've probably heard that Amtrak, due to the pandemic, is cutting back on, on its uh, daily service. Uh, beginning October 1st, it will only be operating three times uh, a week. Uh, those schedules will be announced soon, and that basically is happening to uh, all the long distance trains and even in the north, northeast corridor of the United States where Amtrak has its primary ridership, uh, they're having cutbacks up there as well. Uh, the second primary focus of the, of the commission, of course, is the facilitation and development of front range passenger rail of Pueblo to Fort Collins. Next slide. This is the vision. I don't believe this has changed uh, since we met last. Uh, the segment coalition uh, folks that uh, Jacob referred to have assisted us in developing this, uh, but primarily we're, we're interested in, in front range passenger rail serving all the communities up and down the front range uh, from Pueblo to Fort Collins. And we believe this is really critical to uh, Colorado's future considering the congestion on I-25 that, that you have just had some really excellent presentations about. Uh, again, we're looking for front range passenger rail to uh, provide a transportation option. Right now, the only option you have is, is CDOT's Bustang service, uh, and that has been attracting more riders than I think the department ever anticipated uh, when they initiated that service. Um, but we're finding through some, some modeling that there's incredible demand for, for additional options beyond uh, Bustang, and that would be front range passenger rail. We expect this to be a backbone up and down the I-25 corridor that then uh, existing transit and rail services, excuse me, transit services up and down the front range, uh, as well as uh, the Denver metro areas links to uh, some of the R RTD uh, commuter rail and light rail corridors uh, really looks like uh, they'll serve uh, and provide feeder service to, to the backbone front range passenger rail service uh, throughout the region. Next slide. We've had a lot of coordination uh, continuing with uh, all three of the federal agencies that might be the lead agency for a, an environmental impact statement. Uh, federal Railroad Administration, FTA, and FHWA are all still uh, meeting with us on a pretty regular basis. Uh, we've got another meeting scheduled for these agencies in, in uh, October. Uh, right now, we're leaning toward the Federal Railroad Admi Administration being the, the lead agency for NEPA. Uh, when we move into that in a couple of years, uh, that primarily is because uh, the uh, sort of, I guess, the leading contend contention or contenders uh, for the rail alignments appears to be uh, working in cooperation with the Class One railroads uh, throughout most of the corridor. Next slide. Uh, the Commission did uh, receive a 2019 Chrissy Grant Award uh, to work in the, in the Southwest uh, Chief Quarter of the state. Uh, we're really going to be initiating this project in the next couple months. Uh, what the project will be, we'll be uh, doing alternatives analysis to determine uh, the best type of service connecting the Southwest Chief from La Junta, Colorado into Pueblo and on up to Colorado Springs. Uh, some of the folks on the commission are sort of considering this to be the first usable segment of, of front range passenger rail. And we imagine when passenger rail service again uh, gets into Pueblo and Colorado Springs, 
that certainly will create some momentum for the rest of the uh, corridor north of Colorado Springs. Next slide. Here's the map of the corridor again. The blue corridor suggests that we still haven't finalized our alignment. Uh, so we are looking at uh, both the freight rail rights of way as well as the I-25 corridor for uh, this service. The orange line in the southeast corner of the state is the Southwest Chief and the dashed line off of that orange line reflects the uh, through car service that we're anticipating into Pueblo into the Springs. And then the red line is the uh, Amtrak's long distance train from Chicago to San Francisco, uh, the California Zephyr, uh, which goes through uh, Glenwood Canyon. Again, that service as well as the Southwest Chief will be going to three, uh, three times a week, uh, probably at least through next spring. Uh, Amtrak is anticipating going back to seven day a week service, uh, hopefully for their uh, summer peak season in 2021. Next slide. These are the segment stakeholder coalitions uh, that we've been meeting with since last, uh, last November. Uh, again, your representatives from Dr. Cog have, have uh, been very, uh, very um, anxious to participate with us in that central segment. Uh, we have another round of these meetings coming up uh, next in two weeks from now on the 15th through the 17th. Uh, again, we, we utilize these meetings for, for, get, uh, for the various representatives of cities, counties, uh, chambers of commerce, um, MPOs such as Dr. Cog, uh, to provide that local level of, of input into the project. Then we also have corridor stakeholder coalition meeting um, that brings all of the uh, segment coalitions together and looks at the project more at the, at the 180 mile corridor scale. Uh, we're anticipating a second uh, corridor coalition meeting in uh, sometime in, in late October, early November. Next slide. Uh, this basically just shows our timeline. We have moved through the initial project scoping, level one evaluation, and have eliminated a couple uh, routes that we were looking at earlier. And we're now in level two evaluation where we compare the alternatives against the other. Uh, we've got some more planning work to do. We have to do some rail simulation modeling since we're going to be working with the class one railroads and then finalize the preliminary service development plan and then advancing into uh, NEPA. Again, that, that could happen as early as, as late in uh, 2021. Next slide. Again, this describes some of the evaluation that we did back in, in level one. Uh, again, we are still looking at freight rail corridors, but the Union Pacific corridor north of Denver on up to Greeley has now been eliminated from further consideration. So now when we're talking freight rail corridors, it's the BNSF railway uh, from Fort Collins down to Longmont into Boulder and then on into Denver. That basically replicates the RTD's Northwest Rail Corridor. And then we're certainly still evaluating the I-25 corridor uh, up and down uh, all the way from Pueblo to uh, Colorado Springs. South of Denver in the freight rail corridors, BNSF and UP both operate in that corridor. Uh, so all of that uh, from Denver South into Pueblo on the freight rail corridor is still very much in consideration also. We are currently optimizing the various alignments, improving speeds, uh, reducing some of the curvature and the grades, uh, minimizing some of the environmental impacts that would be associated with uh, adding additional uh, rail right of way within the existing freight corridors. The goal is to understand how these corridors, both whether they're in the freight rail rights of way or the highway, uh, can best provide uh, reasonable travel times for front range passenger rail. We're looking at operating speeds ranging anywhere, maximum speeds from 90 to 110, uh, with a possibility of 125 mile an hour speeds from the south end of Colorado Springs into Pueblo, uh, where there isn't as much development. Um, we're certainly uh, in the middle of doing a lot of ridership evaluation right now. Uh, we made a presentation to the, to the commission at its meeting last Friday. And following that, I had an interview with a gentleman from Colorado Public Radio and and you might have seen the article in the Denver Post today, but the preliminary ridership for uh, the alignment along the BNSF and UP freight corridors would be about 3 million riders a year. 
this compares very favorably with a lot of other passenger rail corridors uh, around the country. Next slide. Uh, these are this map is a general overview again of those corridors uh, in the north. Uh, we have two. It's the existing freight rail corridor, as I said, and then the purple line represents the I-25 corridor. The purple line, uh, when it gets into the Denver metro area, since you can't penetrate uh, uh, the I-25 corridor with passenger rail along the very congested I-25 corridor, again, that you just heard about. So that alternative would swing out along E-470 uh, down to Ridgegate and then proceed in the I-25 corridor again all the way south. Uh, the central segment has four corridors. That's basically the BNSF corridor. Uh, the line uh, then, uh, that would be the light blue line all the way down through the metro area. The second alignment is what we call the North I-25 commuter rail update. That study was done for CDOT back in 2014, and it comes down the I-20, or excuse me, comes down the BNSF alignment to Longmont, and then goes out to I-25 and eventually comes into the RTD's North Metro line and proceeds to Denver Union Station along that route. Uh, the other uh, opportunity would be coming down I-25 on the purple line, connecting into North Metro to downtown. And then the fourth line in the central segment is again the, the purple line uh, moving uh, away from the Denver Metro area out along E-470 that would not have direct access to Denver Union Station. And we've just received some ridership numbers which certainly reflect that uh, that would have a very bad impact on, uh, on the total ridership for the corridor. Uh, the fact that those trains would not uh, immediately access Denver Union Station, they would have to make a connection to downtown by way of the uh, RTD's A-line. Uh, next slide, please. And you may have heard some of this information too. Uh, our friends with Amtrak, and Amtrak is one of the non-voting members uh, on, the, on the Rail Commission, but Ray Lang uh, made a presentation to the Commission a couple of months ago where he announced that Amtrak's current uh, reauthorization proposal to the Congress as part of the Federal Transportation Reauthorization includes a $30 billion program uh, called the Network Modernization Program. In this, Amtrak has three or four primary uh, primary priority corridors where they would add new short distance rail service. And uh, Ray Lang has indicated to Spencer and I in a phone call a couple of weeks ago that Colorado is number one on that list in terms of, of new corridors that Amtrak would like to implement service on. Uh, you can see it here on this map, the black line uh, that connects Fort Collins and these are the station locations that Amtrak is, is considering. Uh, if they get this uh, grant approval through, uh, through the Congress, uh, apparently the House of Representatives and House committees have already approved the legislation and it's now awaiting approval uh, in the Senate. Uh, but these would be the station locations, Fort Collins, Loveland, Longmont, Boulder, Denver Union Station, uh, Littleton Station, possibly in the area near Mineral, Castle Rock, Air Force Academy, the Springs, and, and Pueblo. The next slide will show the, uh, the route again connecting to the, uh, to the existing long distance Amtrak trains. Those are the blue lines. And they also have some bus feeder service called Thruway Service, which currently exists to uh, connect Pueblo down to the Southwest Chief, and it connects some of the mountain areas into Denver where they can hook up with the California Zephyr. Next slide. This is just a little bit of a blow up of that same, same slide. This slide shows that the, the proposal that Amtrak has come to, uh, come to Colorado with is that that uh, service would include three round trips a day. A train starting in Fort Collins and Pueblo at six in the morning, another train leaving each of those uh, communities going north and south at 11.30, and then a last train of the day would leave each of those at five. So those six round trips uh, would be a good starter service for front range passenger rail. The exciting news is that Amtrak's proposal would be to provide Colorado with $2.1 billion in uh, capital infrastructure funding 
uh, both track improvements and cars and locomotives. That would be 100% federal money. Uh, and I think that the Rail Commission is really excited about that and being a nice down payment for uh, eventual uh, front range passenger rail service, which would would operate uh, many more trains a day than the three Amtrak trains that you're seeing on this uh, preliminary schedule. Uh, but this is real exciting news. We're anxious to get Amtrak out here to have a meeting with the commission and the governor uh, to announce this uh, more formally. But again, it appears that this uh, proposal from Amtrak has already cleared the House and is now uh, moving into the Senate in, in the Congress. Next slide. These are just some of the results of, of the stakeholder engagement that Jacob referred to earlier. Again, that online MetroQuest survey that, that uh, I was handing the cards out at at, at your uh, board workshop a year ago, uh, the final results of that were that 95% of the people responding to that survey believed that passenger rail service would address or could help address uh, the transportation needs along the front range. Another 92% said they'd be interested in, in using this service if it were available. We knew we were kind of preaching to the choir with that survey. So in, in October, the commission uh, commissioned a survey of, of a telephone survey done by RBI and Magellan. Um, that was October 4th through 8th. We contacted 600 likely voters, and this was a statistically valid sample of, of likely voters in the 2020 election uh, along the 13 front range counties. Again, very strong support. 81% supported a front range service that would have regularly scheduled train service to population centers between Fort Collins and Pueblo. And then we asked the tough question. Uh, since none of the previous questions had asked anything about funding, uh, the question was, would you support a sales tax increase to fund a front range passenger rail service with regularly scheduled service uh, from Fort Collins to Pueblo with an estimated cost of $5 billion? The consultants that did this survey, RBI and Magellan folks, said they were shocked that 61% of the people they contacted said they would still support such a sales tax increase. Uh, only 27% opposed. And this was right at about a year after uh, Prop 109 and, and, and the other uh, proposition went down in flames, about 60%, 40% for, again, a sales tax increase uh, statewide sales tax increase for general transportation purposes. So uh, these have been very positive uh, stakeholder engagements. As, as Jacob mentioned, uh, during the month of July, the commission had an online uh, public meeting. This was advertised pretty much uh, up and down the front range, a lot of newspapers and TV ads, uh, but we got a, a large uh, response to that uh, survey. Once again, the numbers were very positive. At the end Randy, of the survey, excuse sorry, me. Randy, sorry to interrupt. I just want to make sure there's plenty of time for questions before the next meeting gets started. So if you can just summarize for us, that'd be great. Okay. Uh, I'll just wrap that up. We had about 69% of the people uh, responding to that survey again were, uh, were very positive about, about the project. And, and the number of folks that were against it was in the uh, in the 15 to 20 percent range. So again, uh, we just continue to see very strong stakeholder support. Next slide. And that's that's the last slide of my presentation. So I'm happy to take any questions that that uh, any of the board members may have. Thank you so much. Um, that's a very hopeful presentation and what could be a potential legacy project for Colorado. If folks have questions, go ahead and raise your hand now and we can get them answered this afternoon. Any questions from folks? Uh, the first question is from Director Atchison. Hi, Randy, it's Herb Atchison. Hi, Mayor. Uh, can you repeat what you said about DJ? I didn't quite catch it. Okay, DJ Mitchell is now the BNSF's representative on the Southwest Chief and Front Range Passenger Rail Commission. Uh, he has replaced Pete Rickershauser. Uh, and as you know, there's nobody in, in the BNSF organization that, uh, you know, and nobody higher in that organization that deals with passenger rail services. So I really believe that with Amtrak's focus on the Colorado Front Range, with BNSF uh, 
designating DJ to be the representative for the railroad on this commission. Uh, I think that speaks nothing but but uh, great opportunities for the project overall. Yeah, I do know. I know uh, DJ, and I've had several meetings with him down in Fort Worth and on the phone. So he is a good he is a good ad. I appreciate you clarifying. You bet. I thought the minute you said he left BNSF, and then my heart kind of sunk. No, no, Pete Rickershauser, the gentleman that was on the commission for the previous four years uh, since 20, uh, 2017, Pete has retired, but no, DJ has replaced Pete and, and we couldn't be more excited to have DJ on board. All right, thanks, Randy. You bet. Any other questions from members this afternoon? Um, the next comment or question is from Director Deborah Moldy. Ah, yes, thank you. I hope you can hear me well. We sure um, can. Thank you. I have to say first, thank you for this. I'm a huge user of Amtrak and rail back on the East Coast, um, Northeast Corridor, as well as Keystone Line. So mm -hmm. I can see the value in it. Um, and I understand the schedules quite well. I have a couple of comments, and one of them is really more of a question observation. Um, being in Douglas County and um, along I-25, one of the corridors that um, the rail might go on and knowing mm -hmm. obviously that you don't have the route set. I'm concerned that the commission doesn't have a representative from our area in Douglas County on it. And there's a reason I know why they're selected. We're not in RTD, et cetera or in any of the other places, a representation comes through Dr. Cog. And I want to ask if there could be consideration from the municipalities and the unincorporated areas that might not be in this meeting right now, that through which the railway might go. Uh, my town, Castle Pines, is bisected by I-25 and while we have the right-of-way access available for this and I'm an advocate of it uh, we would want to be a part of the conversation and mm -hmm. so I would be asking that there be due consideration of our voice in the process please okay well we can certainly uh, love to add somebody from your community or anybody that you'd like to represent uh, or name as a possible representative to attend our segment stakeholder coalition meetings that's where we really bring in a lot of additional fee uh, individuals above and beyond our, our commissioners uh, so uh, we're having those meetings again uh, the central coalition meeting will be uh, two weeks from today actually uh, September 16th. So uh, if you can uh, follow up with Jacob and, and provide him information as to who you'd like to have us invite uh, to represent the Castle Pines community at that meeting, uh, we'd certainly be glad to do that. Thank you very much. I'll do that. Um, and secondly, the little bit more of a comment and question as well. On um, the timetables, and this might be a little bit granular, once Amtrak comes in, um, what, those timetables um, aren't really high speed by Amtrak's normal standards. I'm wondering once Amtrak comes in, would they, would they come more into the high speed standards that Amtrak normally operates on? No, we're certainly not in this corridor. Uh, again, since the corridor is only 180 miles long, uh, we just felt uh, again, if we are going to be operating um, more so along the, the rights of way of the class one railroads, we felt that the 90 to 110 would be uh, what is normally termed as higher speed. Uh, but we're certainly not looking at high speed rail, you know, in the 125 to 150 uh, mile range that the Acela uh, reaches in the Northeast Corridor. Um, we just think that uh, to serve the number of stations that we would want, uh, and the distances that we're talking about here, those trains wouldn't probably even be able to reach those speeds before they started to slow down for the next station. So we believe that a 90 to 110 mile an hour passenger rail service in the front range will be more than competitive with, uh, with that 
very congested I-25, even with all the great improvements that the engineers and the uh, at CDOT are doing on I-25 from Fort Collins all the way to Pueblo, uh, the 3 million additional folks that are expected to move to the Colorado Front Range in the next 20 years are going to fill all of that up. And, and, and you know, we, we again believe that a 90 to 100 mi 110 mile an hour train it will be uh, extremely competitive with uh, the option of driving your own car along I-25 during peak hours. I certainly tend to agree with you and not to get granular on it, but the 716 to 746 from Littleton to Castle Rock might, having ridden a ton of trains for a long, long period of time, 25 years or so, that's more of a 40 to 50, maybe even 30 mile, 35 mile an hour train to my understanding. So I'm, I'm just kind of hoping that it gets a little bit, um, you know, better because you can drive from Littleton to Castle Rock and on some days for that time. Right. So, no, and, I wouldn't um, pay much. Helpful. Yeah, excuse me. I wouldn't pay much attention to this particular schedule. This is uh, this is one that uh, Amtrak put out. I haven't had any detailed conversations with Ray Lang about what their assumptions were. Uh, but again, we're talking about you know front range passenger rail trains. Uh, or doing rebuilding the corridors to where they could operate at 90 to 110. And I know Amtrak's equipment can certainly go up to 90 at least. So uh, they would be sharing those same tracks. So uh, the travel times here are very, very conservative to what I believe we'll actually be looking at uh, by the time either the Amtrak service is initiated or Front Range Passenger Rail comes online. That's great news. Thank you for that. You bet. Thank you. Thank you, and, and all, to all the directors listening, um, Jacob Rieger, our manager of long-range transportation planning, represents the whole Dr. Cog region on the commission. And so if any people have comments or feedback, you can always provide them to the Dr. Cog staff and make sure our jurisdiction's voices are heard. So we are all at the table, and uh, just like Randy was letting folks know, there are other opportunities to participate as well. The next question or comment comes from Director Jones. Um, you are self-muted. I think, uh, can you hear me now? Yes. Yes. All right. Thank you, Randy, for your presentation. And it You're is welcome. indeed optimistic and hopeful. And when it comes to rail, we need optimism these days. Because as you know, I, I, or maybe you don't know, I hail from the Northwest um, portion mm -hmm. of the metro area. And we've been waiting for Northwest Rail um, patiently uh, with RTD. Um, for um, many years, and the projection is that it won't happen till maybe 2040 or 2050. And mm -hmm. so um, I'm just trying to um, align your presentation and vision of this with um, our failed attempts to date on Northwest Rail and, and understand mm -hmm. how these two efforts fit together. I guess that would be my first question. And the second question is, um, I, I still am a little bit unclear on how um, we're going to pay for operating this front range passenger rail and what's the ultimate vision around that? So that's a two part question. Thanks. Okay. Uh, first part, we have had some very good meetings with uh, uh, another one of my bosses, Bill Van Meter, is also uh, representing RTD's planning group. Uh, Bill is also one of the voting members of the Southwest Chief and Front Range Passenger Rail Commission. We've had some really good meetings with Bill and his staff just recently uh, after the Amtrak announcement came out about you know, some real partnering uh, between Southwest Chief and Front Range Passenger Rail Project and RTD's work uh, to complete uh, either the Northwest Rail Corridor or we still have an option looking at bringing Front Range Passenger Rail in in conjunction with the North Metro Line. Uh, so Bill wants to continue to explore those partnerships with the commission, his board, his new general manager. Uh, he certainly wants to wait till she gets her feet on the ground and, and understands the lay of the land a little bit. But uh, Bill was suggesting a meeting between the RTE board and the, and the rail commission uh, at the earliest opportunity after the new board is seated in early 2021. Um, but he believes RTD and, and the commission can work jointly to uh, you know, solve uh, some of the RTD's issues in, in the northwest part of the Denver metro area. 
Um, second question, how would we pay for the operating costs? Um, that has not yet been determined. Uh, on the Amtrak proposal, again, their, their $2 billion would be for capital improvements and 100% of the operating costs for those three trains, three uh, round trip trains in the first year. And then over a five year sliding scale, uh, by the end of the fifth year, Colorado would be required to be paying the operational subsidies that are, are part of Amtrak's Section 209 uh, program, uh, where they have probably 10, 12 different states around the country have what are referred to as state-supported trains. And those are where Amtrak picks up some of the subsidy and, and the states pick up the rest. Uh, we haven't had detailed conversations with Amtrak yet about what their anticipation would be for uh, ridership on those three trains, what Colorado's share of that operating cost after five years might be. Um, we also, in the Front Range Passenger Rail Study, uh, have not yet uh, got into the level of cost estimating for either operations or capital uh, to be able to answer that question, but we're, we're moving toward that and expect to have those kind of answers uh, to the costs uh, both capital and operating for front range passenger rail by the end of the year. Thanks, Randy. You bet. All right. Are there any other questions on this agenda item this evening? Seeing none, that'll take us over um, to our executive director, Doug Rex, for an announcement. Rick, thank you, Madam Chair. Um, you. This this announcement um, is 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 uh, for our p &E members that are on the phone. Um, as you know, we're, uh, our meeting was scheduled for 5.30. Um, so we're planning on taking just a quick little break. So we'll start our meeting promptly at 5.40. And just, just remember that you have to log out of this one and use the link that Melinda sent you in the email last week, or you can find the, uh, the link on our webpage, on, the, on our homepage under uh, the performance and engagement tab. So. Um, hope to see everybody in eight minutes. Thank you, Madam Chair. Great. Thank you. Everyone else who's not part of PME, we'll see you in a couple of weeks at the board um, regular meeting. Have a great evening. We are adjourned.